Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 17, and this is what it says. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with the tax gatherers and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and the worst hair results. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wineskin pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins. And both are preserved. Pray with me. Jesus, we get to be a part of your day and what you're doing. May we never take that for granted. But move and, and transform our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the things after preaching for just a little bit that you begin to figure out is that you develop habits. Some of those habits good and some of those habits not so good. Eugene McGee talks about this. He said that when he, he, he preaches that he has a tendency to get excited and, and gesture very large. Well, one of the things that happens when he makes big gestures is that his shirt tail comes out of the back of his pants. So there's another thing that he has to do is make a small gesture, reaching behind him and tuck his shirt tail into the back of his pants. And he says that, that one Sunday he was preaching and he was really excited and so his gestures got really large and he knew that he automatically would just go back there and tuck in the shirt tail into the back of his pants. He said after a little while he realized that he was tucking in more shirt tail than he got dressed with that morning. He said what had happened was accidentally he'd backed up into the American flag and he began to tuck it into the back of his pants. He, he said he, he wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't real sure if he had the flag or the flag had him. Well, that's the way it is with habits, isn't it? Sometimes we don't know if we have the habits or the habit has us. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about this morning. It's kind of a riddle because Matthew, Matthew, the one who, who writes the gospel of Matthew, talks about his own call. But he doesn't give any prelude to it. He just says that Jesus turned to him and said, follow me. And he, he left the tax office and followed Jesus. 
Well, Matthew had been calling the following the habits of a tax gatherer. Now, it, it's not the same habits of tax gatherers nowadays. He, he wasn't just about, you know, passing out 1099s and W-2s and making sure that people had done their math correctly. Tax gatherers back in Jesus' day had a little more the habits of a mafioso. That their habits were extortion. That they knew what their neighbors were up to. They had to in order to collect the taxes. That one of their habits was is that they went to the Roman government and they bid for the job. And the Romans said, well, this is the tax that we expect collected. Anything over and above that, you can keep it. They knew where that hidden field was that a farmer might have to raise just a few more fruits and vegetables, a little more crop that to have a little extra cash. Well, he would be taxed on that field, so it was the tax collector that would go out, sneak, and search until they found that field. Or it might be that uh, people would... The farmers would bring in their crops on a two-wheeled cart into town. And a two-wheeled cart would be all that people saw. Because a four-wheeled cart, well, that was taxed more. And maybe they would hide the four-wheeled cart and, and use it maybe only at night. Well, the tax gatherer had to know where that four-wheeled cart was and tax them on it. They were... They were well practiced in the habits of extortion. They were well practiced in the habits of, of leaning on their friends, of collaborating with, with the enemy. And it, he couldn't follow Jesus and keep the habits of the tax collector. And then Matthew tells one story after another after another. That when he goes to eat with Jesus, it's the Pharisees that don't like the habits of Jesus. He's eating with sinners and tax collectors. And then it's the, the disciples of John the Baptist that don't like the habits of Jesus. And it's almost like they're piling on along with the Pharisees. It's not that they're eating with the wrong people. It's that they're, that they're eating at all. That John the Baptist's Disciples, they have the habit of fasting, and Jesus isn't doing that. Well, Jesus tells a, a story about a bridegroom. And that in the time of celebration, that's when is the time to celebrate. And there'll be a time of mourning and a time of fasting, but now is not that time. And, and that Matthew, he, he draws all this together with a, a parable that Jesus talks about. That you don't put new cloth on an old garment. That if you sew a, a, a new cloth patch on an old garment, that, that when that patch, the new cloth shrinks, it'll make the hole even bigger. That you use what's appropriate for that garment, an old piece of cloth with an old garment, and, and, and new wines with new wineskins, and old wine with old wineskins, that the habits are appropriate for what's going on. That Jesus was talking about habits of the kingdom. Habits that are appropriate for following Jesus are not the same habits that are appropriate for an old life. That Jesus talked about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven more than anything else. And he, he came in order to usher in a new kingdom. And that those who have eyes to, to see and those who have ears to hear can see and hear the 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 voice of God, the hand of God moving in right here in the middle of this old kingdom. And then in order to, to see and to hear what God's up to here now, that we've got to develop new habits for a new kingdom. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. New habits for a new kingdom. Habits of gratitude. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Leonard Sweet tells a story that happened some years back that a little boy in the Midwest was born blind. His parents prayed that the little boy might receive his sight. And when he was five years old, the family physician told the parents that he had read about a procedure done at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And that a physician there was doing a, a procedure that might 
might enable the little boy to recover his sight. Well, the physician and, and the, the parents begin to, to ask questions and inquire about how long the, the little boy might need to stay in the hospital, how to get there and come home, and the cost. Well, they were, were not wealthy at all, and they couldn't afford the, the travel and the time spent there. They couldn't afford the stay in the hospital and, and all the medical costs. But the church rallied behind the family and rallied the community. And people began to put together what they had. And, and sure enough, they got together enough money where the family could, could go to Boston from the Midwest. And, and the little boy could, could get the procedure, the surgical procedure. Well, the day came for them to leave. And, and the little boy had his teddy bear with him. And ah, Teddy looked awful. I, the, he was missing an eye. Part of his ear was chewed off. He was... The, stretching the seams and and his mom said well why don't you leave your teddy bear here and we'll get you a new one when we get to Boston the little boy said no I need him well that's all it took mom said okay so they went to Boston and in all of the tests that the little boy had leading up to the procedure the, the little boy wanted his teddy bear with him he was poked and prodded and Teddy was there with him every step of the way. Well, the staff began to fall in love with the little boy in the days leading up to the surgery. And when it came time for the surgery, a nurse had made a, a hospital gown, a surgical gown for the, the teddy bear as well as the, the little boy. He went in for the procedure and after it was done, the doctor told his parents, he said, I believe the the surgery was successful, but we won't know for a few days. We need to keep his eyes wrapped as, as they heal. And the day came for them to take off the bandages. And sure enough, for the first time ever, the little boy was able to see his mother. He was able to see his father. He was able to see the doctor, the balloons, the flowers, the teddy bear, everything around him for the first time and the first time ever. Well, the doctor said he needs to stay here for a few more days to make sure that infection doesn't set in. And then there's no reason that you all can't go home as long as infection doesn't set in his eyes. Well, the day came for them to leave. And the doctor came to say goodbye to the little boy. And the little boy handed his teddy bear over to the doctor. The doctor said, no, I know you, you love Teddy. And, and I won't, I, I, I can't take teddy bear from you. That's when the little boy said, I want you to have him. It's my way of saying thank you. Well, the doctor took the teddy bear and there on the 10th floor at Massachusetts General Hospital, for many years there was a display. And below the display was a handwritten note by the doctor. And it said, this is the highest fee I've ever received for services rendered. Well, there's a name for that. And that name is gratitude. Gratitude. It's not just a feeling in the heart. It's a habit. It's something that we practice. It's, it's a holy habit. It's a kingdom habit. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's a kingdom habit. It's God's will for you and for me. That there's something in us when we begin to to practice that, that habit of gratitude, we develop eyes that see the hand of God moving and we give thanks and praise to God even more. That when we give thanks, we begin to hear in a way that we didn't hear before when we practice the, the, the habit of gratitude and it causes us to, to give thanks. To give thanks to God, to give praise to God, and to give glory to God. It's a habit that, that at first we begin to practice, and we might have that habit, but after a while, that habit has us. It's a, it's a kingdom habit. But it's not the only kingdom habit. There's also the habit of repentance. C.S. Lewis talks about when he was a boy, he had bad teeth. 
and that he hated going to the dentist. That if ever he had a a toothache or a pain in his mouth, he would try as long as he could to keep it from his mother because he knew that the minute that he told his mother that he had a toothache or a pain that, or a sore tooth, that she was going to take him to the dentist. And the dentist wasn't going to say, well, a little tooth decay is all right. The, the dentist wasn't going to say, a little fec- infection is okay. No, that his dentist was going to get to the bottom of it and make sure that all of the decay was gone and all of the infection was gone because that's what good physicians do. Jesus is the great physician. And the habits that infect our lives just naturally, just about every day, are too often habits that break down the relationship between us and other people, the relationship between us and God. And Jesus, the good physician, it's what he did on the cross. He gave his life to take away the power of the infection of those habits. To take away the sin, the shame, the fear. To take away those habits that would would make our, our lives no death and destruction and not life and peace. Jesus gave his life as the, on the cross that he might change who we are. Change, and, and that change is called repentance. And it's not just a change of habit, it's More than anything, it's a change of mind and a change of attitude. He rose from the grave to give us power in the here and now, not just when we die, power in the here and now to change, to change once and for all. Well, it takes practice. It's not that we we do nothing. No, we seek that change through repentance. We seek His power through repentance. That that word repent was the first word in Jesus' first sermon. And Matthew records that it was a sermon that He preached again and again and again and again. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That God's will in the here and now, that when Jesus began to usher in this new kingdom, right here in the middle of the old kingdom, it required that we practice a change, a transformation, a change of habits that, that we began to take on the character of Christ and not the character of decay, not the character of death and sin. It's what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. And it's a habit that we can start practicing with His power, start practicing today. It's a kingdom habit. And the more that we begin to practice repentance, well, it's the practice of repentance begins to have us. But it's not only the habit of repentance, not only the practicing the habit of gratitude, it's also practicing the habit of hope, of hope. A few years back, there was an NFL team that had a, a good record going into the playoffs. They had high hopes of winning the Super Bowl. But in their first playoff game, they didn't execute very well at all. They were missing blocks, missing tackles, fumbling the ball. They were dropping passes. And at the end of the first half, they were behind 21 to nothing. As they went into the locker room at halftime, they knew that the coach was going to read them the riot act. That he was going to be red-faced and he was going to be loud. And talking to them about all the places that they had blown it. But that's not what happened. Instead, the locker room was quiet. They had a chance to think about what they had done. 
And it was at the end, the very end of the halftime, that the coach did go into the locker room. And instead of, of words telling them everything that they had done wrong, he said, gentlemen, you've got a great second half inside of you. Now go play it. Now go and play it. That that's the hope that Jesus gives to you and to me. Not just to go in there and, and, and do our best, but that His best will live in, in you and me. Colossians 3.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Not that you just might go out there and do your best, but that He'll do His best from you. It doesn't mean that there's no trying from us. It doesn't mean that there are no habits that we practice. That we practice leaning on Him. We practice relying on Him. We practice trusting in Him. That His habits that they give us hope, hope for the second half of life. This morning it may be that um, nobody needs to tell you that you've blown it. That that first half of life didn't go at all the way that you planned it. And that you fumbled and that you missed the mark. And it may be that this morning you've been practicing that over and over again in your head. That's the first half and it's gone. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And that's what a Christian is. Someone who has the, the Christ, Christ living on the inside of them. That gives hope now, today. That we begin to practice his power and his strength. It's why he rose from the grave that he might live his life through us. And that we might turn to him daily in hope. And daily practice his presence. That as we live daily, we might have the eyes to see what, what God's doing in the world around us. That we might see his hand. We might hear his voice. And truly respond. It may be that what you've been practicing have been habits of self-justification or maybe practicing habits of, that, of your rights and not your blessings. That instead of repenting, you've had excuses. Instead of changing, you've been thinking maybe if you just try a little harder. Jesus has power that we don't have. What he did on the cross, it was enough to forgive you. And when he rose from the grave, it's enough to give you and me power to turn, to turn toward him and began practicing the holy habit of each day turning a new attitude, a new mind that we might develop the mind of Christ in the here and now and begin practicing the habit of gratitude. Not only of repentance, but gratitude. Not one day, but this day. That it might not be a habit that we have, but a habit that, well, a habit that has us. And in practicing that habit, we might begin to relate, yes, to Jesus, to Jesus Christ in a different way, but we begin relating to others in a different way. And that in everything we give thanks. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, may we know that what you did on the cross, it's enough. And that our lives, well, they're not in our hands, they're in your hands. And that we rely on your strength. It doesn't mean we don't try. It means we rely on your strength and not our own. To give thanks. Because there are a lot of things that, well, we're not thankful for, but may we be thankful in them. And look for your hand in the middle of all things. Lord, that habit of repentance, it doesn't come without practice. It's not natural for any of us to say that we were wrong. It's not natural for any of us to, to practice change 
As a matter of fact, that's what we want least. But when you rose from the grave, you rose with a power we don't have. And may we practice repentance. That was the first word of your first sermon. And Lord, I believe that you're saying it to us now again this day. So that we might turn to you in hope. And know that when you rose from the grave, you rose to live your life through us. And our hope isn't in our ability to to practice a new habit. It's in your ability to give us strength to practice that habit. And our hope is in your glory, in your praise, in what you might do through us starting now, this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. We believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us. 